we are going to talk about how to create a hook, okay? And a hook allows you to create addictive content for your brand. But the really the reason you need to do this is we need to actually combat what I call commodity content, okay? Commodity content is the raw material of the online world. It's what makes the the online world work, but it's not necessarily the kind of content that will actually build a relationship with the audience you've got or you're trying to get. So the the reason you have to think like this is we actually live in an information overload world, okay? And information overload, I, I mean, you know what it is. You, you face it whenever you open your own inbox, okay? But, but it's a paradox. Just because there is more information available does not mean one can consume more, okay? Does that make sense? Just because there's more information available does not mean one can consume more. And when I say more information, I mean I mean a lot more, okay? 17 new web pages are published every single second. So here we go. This is 17, 34, 51, 68, 85. 85 web pages were just created and published on the web in those last five seconds, and somebody is supposed to consume them. And we're contributing to this. I mean, all of us uh, as content creators, as, as marketers, as brands, we are creating some of those web pages that are contributing to information overload. And information overload actually looks like this, especially if you go back in time, okay? So you're looking at the amount of information on the, on the y-axis there, and on the x-axis you're looking at time from 1950 to today. Day. And the gray line is the information you can actually consume, okay? The black line is the, the amount of information you think is available to consume. And in 1950, especially in the U.S., there wasn't a big gap between the information you could actually consume and the information you thought was available, right? You had uh, your favorite television station. You had your favorite radio station. You knew there was another TV station or a couple more radio stations you could watch uh, or listen to, but you didn't consume them, okay? Uh, you Maybe you got a couple magazines. Uh, you knew there were other magazines out there, but you only subscribed to the ones you wanted. That's in the difference between that, that gap is actually very important as you move through time. When you get to the 1990s, in the United States, we had the cable television explosion. And this is when, that's kind of in the middle of this chart here, when you see, see those lines start to go away from each other, uh, that's when we all started talking about the 200 channel cable universe. And even in the US, these cable television stations showed up every day, it seemed like. There was CNN, then there was CNN International, then there was CNN Head Headline News, then there was CNN Espanol, then, then there was ESPN, and ESPN2, ESPN Classic, ESPNU, then there was CNBC and MSNBC and Fox News and Fox Business News and Bloomberg and on and on it went. And that's when you realize there's this gap starting to widen between the amount of information we think is available, but the information we can actually consume. And even if you consumed information for a full 24 hours, you just stayed up all night, it, there's a there's a limit to that, right? It flatlines. And today, the gap is unbelievably large. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're trying to buy, what you're interested in. What, there's always one more piece of information you could consume before you make that purchase or think about you know going on a vacation, whatever it is in the online world. There's another link that leads you somewhere else. And as marketers, one of the problems, I think, is we're chasing the perceived opportunity. We are chasing the social stream. We're contributing to information overload by just creating more content that we hope our audience will consume. We're posting it on Facebook, we're emailing it to them, we're shoving it down their throats in the hopes that they'll consume this information. The actual opportunity, especially when it comes to email, is creating quality content over quantity, okay? If you start to really think about being part of the information your audience wants to consume and actually being part of their, their habitual content consumption, that's where you start to have really big success with your content. And in fact, you can create less content but see bigger results, okay? Bigger results, less content. That's the goal of creating higher quality content and being part of the information your audience actually wants to consume. So I want you to start thinking immediately about fitting into the information one actually wants to consume. Do not contribute to information overload with commodity content. And I want you to ask yourself this. What if we just tried to own some quality time in our customer's inbox? 
What if we, what if we just wanted to own two minutes of our audience's time once a week? What if we ignored click-through rates and our goal was just a zero opt-out rate and an ever-growing subscription base? I want you to start asking yourself, what time in your audience's life can you own? I, that's the question we're going to help answer today as we think about combating commodity content and information overload so that we're part of the information our audience actually wants to consume. And if you want to do this, the secret to doing this that I learned in television is to create a hook, okay? Now a hook is a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare or entrap your audience. Let me say it once again, a hook is a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare or entrap your audience. And I want you to start thinking about what that means to your content. Let me show you what a great hook looks like. Someone that's done this really well, probably a lot of you have heard the story of Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, he's the guy that, that started Wine Library TV. But what's interesting about Gary's story is the evolution he went through. And I'm going to use a lot of video examples just because I think they're easier to see, especially on a webinar. Uh, we, we don't need a lot more boring slides. Uh, and so I'm going to play a little bit of, of these videos so that you get a taste for it. But this could have been email content. It doesn't need to just be video. Don't worry about that. Think about the hook that ends up, uh, you know, building his brand. So if you don't know Gary Vaynerchuk, he basically took over his, his uh, dad's liquor store in New Jersey in 2006, and it was a $4 million a year business, okay, which is an average business for a liquor store in New Jersey in 2006. That's the average revenue. And he decided he wanted to do something cool. Instead of just having a, a boring old liquor store, he wanted to bring some new technology into the mix and he decided to start creating a video every single day five days a week he said he was going to review some wines for his audience and he started doing this every day so I'm gonna play you episode number two this is just the very second episode and I want you to look at the content okay this is this is this is the, how he started wine library TV I'm gonna turn it up and, and, and shut up for a second you ready hello everyone and welcome to episode two of wine library TV I'm your host Gary Vaynerchuk, Director of Operations. Today we are going to visit the wonderful and interesting world of Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is... Okay, that, that looks unbelievably boring, right? I mean, I don't need to play you the whole video of episode number two. Gary Vaynerchuk is doing what every wine snob has ever done on, on any video program, uh, which is sound like they know more than we do, and talk about the wines in a snotty way, right? And, and Gary Vaynerchuk was doing this for 76 days. 76 days he did the same type of show and if you've seen Gary Vaynerchuk you know this is not the Gary Vaynerchuk we know and love today. Gary Vaynerchuk basically was creating the kind of show he thought everybody wanted and this show is commodity content and he started getting basically uh, you know emails from people that started telling Gary Look, Gary, you're, you're, you're really bad at this. I'm a wine guy myself. You don't know anything about wine. Can you even drink wine? A lot of people thought he looked too young. Uh, they, they told him he was an idiot. And Gary was getting really you know, upset uh, that people weren't really embracing these videos. And Gary told me that on episode 76, he got an email from a really obnoxious wine snob that said, Gary, you're a moron. You're just a sports guy who likes wine. You're just a sports guy who likes wine. And Gary took a step back and said, wait a second. He's right. Why am I doing something that, that I'm not? I am a sports guy who happens to like wine. Why can't I embrace that and start creating that content? So that's what he did. And this is what happened five years later. By 2011, he had a $60 million a year mail order business. He was still doing the videos every single day. And this is, this is an a episode I, I can't remember, almost, almost near the end. So let me play you what the show looked like when he embraced the idea that he was going to do a sports show about wine. Here it goes. There you go. Now that sounds like any radio call-in sports show, right? And that's what Gary did. He created a hook. He created a different kind of wine show. It wasn't for wine snobs. It wasn't by wine snobs. It was a sports show 
for the wine world. If I had to classify the hook of this show, it was ESPN Sports Center meets wine tasting. That is a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare or entrap your audience. And Gary didn't even know he was creating a hook. But that's what created a show that 90,000 people a week on average watched. That is the power of a hook. All of a sudden, people stopped thinking of him as a, a wannabe wine snob and had a unique angle on creating great content. Wine Library TV is not commodity content. It is not the raw material of the on online world. Commodity content is not worth subscribing to. A hook makes your content unique. There is a way to actually stand out, and that's what Wine Library TV and Gary Vaynerchuk did. Content with a hook builds relationships, relationships build trust, and trust is what drives revenue. And that's exactly what happened with Gary Vaynerchuk. He had a hook all of a sudden that built a relationship with a new audience. That audience all of a sudden started trusting him and his wine recommendations, and they started ordering wine from him. And that's what took a $4 million a year business into a $60 million a year business. That's the power of a hook. So look, we live in an opt-in world. All of those logos you see right there, everyone, I don't even know what some of those are, but they all have a version of a subscription, right? Fan, follow, friend, these are all synonyms for subscribe. And the most basic subscription today is an email subscription, and it's still unbelievably powerful. But I want you to start thinking about harnessing the power of a subscription. Why? Because a subscription allows you to build a relationship with the audience before they need you or so they need you. And Gary did that unbelievably well. He created a, such a great show that he inspired people to buy the ones he reviewed. And he did it in such a unique way that you fell in love with the show, with Gary, and then the wines that he was talking about. So what if your content brand had a compelling hook? Wine Library TV is a content brand. It's, it, it's, it, it's thought, thinking of it like a TV show. I want you to ask yourself, what simple twist on a familiar theme will entrap or ensnare my audience? That is a great example of a hook. Okay, sorry, I need a drink of water. I hope you guys are doing okay. I'm having fun. I know it's early for you guys in, on the Pacific time zone. I hope you had your coffee. <laughs> okay, how do you create a hook? You have to think like a television executive. Now, I came out of the television world. I actually used to produce for the Today Show uh, for ABC Family. And I eventually got my dream job at Sesame Street um, and the Jim Henson Company. And I worked for the Muppets. And it was a really great experience. And it was in television that I learned about a hook, OK? And a hook is something very, very common. It's been around for decades in the television business. Let me show you what a hook looks like in TV. Let me show you the power of a hook. I want you to just quickly look at the beginning of video. This video is from Albany, New York, from a television station there called WRGB. And this is April of 1997. And it's a news program, OK? It's a segment in their local news. So let's just play a little. And I'm going to pause it uh, and so that you can really soak it in. Angela McInerney, wife and mother, has working women's guilt. And believe me, my family wishes I cooked. So what's stopping you? Uh, exhaustion. During the week, she and her working husband do not eat with their kids. So we're going to do a meal in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> Let me see you try. Okay, so you heard of Angela said, right? She's oh, like, yeah. She, you can't do it in 30 minutes like this. Is like this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Who is that? Do you know who that is? Can you tell even in the blurry shot? I'll let it play. Buyer and kitchen manager at Cowan and Lobel, Rachel Ray. We're going to make some grilled swordfish. Okay. And we're going to make some grilled vegetables and potatoes. That's right. That is Rachel Ray. Okay. Rachel Ray worked at a grocery store called Cohen and Lobel's in upstate New York. And she had this simple idea that people could create a meal in 30 minutes or less. That is a hook. It's a simple twist on the cooking show. Look, there were tons and tons of cooking shows before Rachel Ray came along, right? She came up with a new idea, a simple twist on a familiar theme. She took the normal cooking show and said, I'm not going to use any camera magic and editing magic. I can create a meal in 30 30 minutes or less in real time on a television show. And that's what built Rachel Ray into the Rachel Ray of today. Rachel Ray started with a simple twist on a familiar theme called 30 Minute Meals. And now she has 
a pretty crappy talk show. No offense, Rachel. I just don't think it's that great. Uh, and she has a huge line of products that have fallen out of what she started as 30-minute meals. All this orange stuff that you can buy at your local stores around the world is Rachel Ray cookware and cookbooks and cook stuff that all comes out of that simple twist on a familiar theme. And what's it worth? Well, Rachel Ray alone, not all her businesses and her shows and her stuff, Rachel Ray alone is worth $60 million. And the key to her success was a simple hook. And that's what I learned in television. The power of a hook is what makes the show work. That's what makes it stick. That's what keeps people coming back. So you've got to think like a television executive to create a hook. Now, I, I know this, this looks great, uh, but let me help you embrace some simple ways to find your hook and build your audience. And we're going to start with the simplest kind of hooks and go to the most complicated. Okay, This doesn't have to be hard. Uh, it can be fun. But I want to challenge you to think about a hook. Uh, in a new way, all right? The easiest one is what I call the gimmick, okay? This is secret number one, the gimmick. And I'm going to show you two examples quickly of gimmick types of hooks, um, but they'll help you uh, even, even find an easy way to implement a hook for your content, okay? This is the inside joke, okay? And, and let me show you what Trish Witkowski has done. She's the chief folding officer at a company called FoldRight. Uh, and the company FoldRight is a B2B business that sells templates uh, and custom folding resources to print designers who create direct mail pieces. So this is not an easy sale, right? It's, you've got to find those people, you've got to get them involved, you've got to get them to subscribe to your content, and you've get, really got to get them excited. And Trish is the CEO of this company that sells software, essentially, to these kinds of designers. And Trish realized that she needed to get these designers to subscribe to something and change what they were you know, creating every day as designers so that they needed her product more and more. So what she did was she went to YouTube and created the 60 second super cool fold of the week. Okay. 60 seconds, super cool fold of the week. That is her content brand. That is the title of her show. That is what people start to know her for. Let me play you a little bit of this episode of the 60 second, super cool fold of the week so you can get a flavor for what the content looks like. And I want to see if you can pick up what the gimmick is, what the hook is here in this episode. Everybody, I'm Trish Wachowski, Victor.com, and this is your 60 second super cool fold of the week. You know, invitations and greeting cards are just great opportunities for creativity with folding. I've been getting a lot of them recently. Keep them coming, so fun. Um, this one comes from Connection Printing Consultants in Bend, Oregon. Really fun. They did a um, like Swiss chalet themed holiday card and has their logo down the side, so good visibility there. And then um, you open it up and it creates this. Like a snowflake. Ooh, a snowflake. Okay, you, you, there's. Uh, it's not actually 60 seconds. This one's a minute 53. But you get the point, right? And I, I don't know if you picked up on what the the gimmick might be, the reoccurring theme that entraps or ensnares her audience. Will I will show you what it is. But if you noticed. She was wearing a t-shirt that said folds are us, okay? What's happened is people started subscribing to Trish's 60 second super cool fold of the week, which comes out every single Thursday afternoon, and she's now got uh, over 200 videos. She's been doing this for four years, and she gets you know anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 uh, views, and the biggest ones have 10 or 12,000 views um, on every single one of the videos she's created. People subscribe, though, because they love her hook, okay? Let me show you what she invites people to subscribe to on her newsletter. It doesn't say sold, sign up for my crappy newsletter. It says sign up for Fold of the Week. Do you see that? It's fast and it's free. Join the Fold Factory community today to start receiving Trish's popular, fun, and inspiring video series in your inbox. Fold of the Week is Fold-tastic. And every single week, people come and watch, not just for the inspiration. That's kind of a side bonus. They come and watch because her hook is so powerful in all the funny t-shirts she wears. And you can see in that picture at the very beginning, she's known for the t-shirts. And in fact, they got so excited about the t-shirts, the audience, that they started asking if they could order a t-shirt. 
So she set up a Zazzle store and people buy these t-shirts. You can see they this thanks for folding, honk, honk if you love folding, what happens in the bindery stays in the bindery. This is the kind of shirt she wears every single week. There's a different funny quote. And if you ask people in the industry, do you know Trish Witkowski's 60 second super cool fold of the week? They will say, is that the woman that wears the funny t-shirts? Bingo. That's her hook. Her hook is what ensnares or entraps the audience so they keep coming back to see what's on next week. Okay? Yes, her inspirational videos have worked, they've driven business, but what's really important about the, 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 tr the hook for her content is that t-shirt. Okay? That's the gimmick. This is from Wistia. This is called Pass the Hat. And Wistia actually is a professional video hosting uh, platform. So they're, they're, you know, they ho host your videos for anything from training to corporate videos, whatever you want to put up there. It's a really great company with a really great product. And they create tons and tons of top content. They, they, they started doing these things they called Top Hat Tuesday Tips, I think is what it was actually called. And they would uh, distribute these great little videos. Let me show you what it is. It's a very simple gimmick. And I'm going to play you the intro so that you can actually see how they included it. But what they did was they would pass the hat every week to another one of the Wistia team where they would share a video tip, OK? It's Wistia's Top Hat Tuesday Tips. Wearing the top hat today is Jeff Benson. Greetings. Today's tip is use live action bumpers for your screencasts. There you go. You get it, right? It's a great way to introduce the team from Wistia and get them involved in, in creating the content. You can see Jeff here is very happy and excited about it. But it's also a great gimmick that, that from week to week is the consistent element that brands the video. Okay? And I loved Tuesday's Top Hat Tuesday tips. <laughs> I love alliteration too, so that works. So pass the hat is the second gimmick. But I want you to think about embracing the gimmick. What silly element can help create consistency and a through thread for the content you're creating. That will help to create the most basic type of hook, especially for any type of uh, online content, is the gimmick. Okay. All right, number two, the micro day part. This is the concept of making an appointment with your audience. And you can actually leverage the appointment with your audience, like, like uh, you know, Top Hat Tuesday or, um, or the Thursday appointment with Fold Factory's videos. Those are appointments with the audience. And I call this micro day parting. And if you're familiar with television or radio sales or, or uh, well, everybody knows primetime TV, right? Those four hours at night. Primetime TV is a day part. In the online world, you can actually get deeper and deeper than just that one four hour period. You can micro day part. Remember when I said I want you to think about owning two minutes of your audience's time? What time can you own? And this is based on a concept called occasion based marketing. And Corona has done this really well, right? If you if I took away the logo on this image, you'd still know it was Corona. People embrace the idea of, of drinking from Corona when they get to the beach because over decades Corona has imprinted this picture in your mind. So when you show up at a beach, one of the first things you might order at the bar is a Corona because they've defined that moment in your life. And if you go and use Google Trends, this is Google Trends by the way, if you haven't used Google Trends, it's one of the most underutilized marketing tools on the planet. But it actually shows you demand for Corona beer over time. And that's from 2006 to today. You can see the spike. Where is the spike in the US? It's always in the middle of the summer. Why? Because everybody thinks of that moment in time when they should drink a Corona. Now you can do the same kind of thing for your audience. You can make an appointment with them and there's actually a tool you can use. There's some data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics creates uh, every two years. It's called the uh, American Time Use Survey, A-T-U-S, American Time Use Survey. And the New York Times in 2008 turned it into this amazing infographic. So we're looking at old data. But they, they ask 150,000 Americans to journal how they spend their day moment to moment over the course of a whole day and then they compile the data so that you can see it. And you can even break it down into you know who it is or what race they are, how old are they, do they have a bachelor. You can even go into, if you go to get raw data, go even deeper. But you can see how people spend their time and you can micro day part. So this is the big one. You can see people are drinking and eating at 6.40 p.m. 14% of men are eating or drinking. You can look at traveling. 
So if you were going to create a podcast, an email or a reminder to people as to when they should download the podcast, you want to be at the peak of that travel time. So you want to get them right before those spikes in their traveling time. And you know how long it should be because uh, there's an hour and 14 minutes that men spend traveling every single day. It's about the same for women and, and men and, and the average obviously is an hour and 12 minutes in the U.S. So you know that they're spending about half their time in the morning, half their time at night traveling and you can see the peaks and the micro day parts you could own. Here's computer use. This is for men. Keep in mind this is 2008 so they were only spending nine minutes and they were on at 9 p.m. So I don't care what the standard email you know, best practices are. Think about your audience. If you want to reach them, when can you be part of their day? When can you own two minutes of their time? Don't sp send it at 6 a.m. because none of them are online. Look at that 9 p.m. hump there. That's where you want to be. How about personal care? You could even own the moments where people are shaving or showering or in the bathroom. You can see that men and women spend about the same amount of time. It's not as big as the gap as you might expect, 39 minutes versus 54 minutes. And you see that giant spike in the morning at about 6.15. That You want to own that moment. So what time in your audience's life can you own? Now you can take that micro day part and turn it into part of your hook, okay? Whiteboard Friday is a really great series that's created by Moz, okay? Moz is a software platform, a, a software as a service provider that, that actually helps you really understand how to leverage the content you're creating. They have a pro subscription and a local subscription. They're trying to sell software that helps you with online marketing. But what they've done masterfully well is Rand Fishkin, who's the CEO or was the CEO of the company, has created an appointment with his audience every single Friday called Whiteboard Friday. And you can go back to 2008. He's been doing this. Since 2008, they've been making an appointment with their audience. And they're, these, again, are videos, but they, they email you and remind you that Whiteboard Friday is up. And you can see how well it's branded. Rand is, Rand is a, a hilarious, wonderful presenter, actually, and is a great guy. And his personality shines through. And this is what's built the Moz brand, but also built Rand's brand. And the and the hook is Whiteboard Friday. I'll play you just a little bit so you get a, a flavor. Oh, that's loud. Howdy, Moz fans, and welcome to a new edition of Whiteboard Friday, the very first one of 2014. Hope you all had a wonderful... Okay, I won't play the whole thing. You get it, right? He's, he's going to answer a question in front of the whiteboard. And he does. this is not two minutes of video. This is ten minutes of video. It's unbelievably compelling content delivered really well. And it's a simple hook around a micro day part of Whiteboard Fridays. And you can see on their YouTube channel... Uh, they have uh, you know, 10,000 subscribers almost, hundreds of thousands of views, and it's the influencers in the market that consume Rand's content. And that's great for Rand because those influencers are the people that then consult or, or get people to sign up for the Moz software. They recommend it to their clients. Uh, this is something that actually our agency, Tipping Point Labs, did. It's called the micro day part for executive elevation. What we were trying to do was get CMOs who were always flying and on the go to read our content, and this was in the old days. when when you couldn't have an electronic device on on the airplane it would could it had to be an off mode right between the time you um, you left the gate and you got to 35,000 feet so there was this moment we could own and here was the concept we were gonna give them a, a report that, that suggested they could read it in one flight and we called it executive elevation each month we write executive elevation to help sea level staff understand the rapidly evolving digital landscape our reports are specifically crafted to enhance your in-flight experience. With your phone off, your email unavailable, and your tray table down, you can focus on becoming an expert in key aspects of digital marketing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we we invited them to actually print this out so you don't have to have your device on and have it with you ready to read. That is owning even a specific moment in someone's life that you've helped define instead of they've defined for you. So what if we made an appointment with our audience? What two minutes of your audience's life could you own? That's what I want to start thinking about. That's the micro day part, making an appointment with your audience. Okay, number three. We're getting a little more complicated here, okay? Those are, those are fairly easy. Now we're getting into the mashup. And everybody knows, I hope, what a mashup is, you know, putting a bunch of things together to make something new. Uh, I'm going to show you something that ShopLocket um, did. This is ShopLocket. Now, these people are, help hardware makers, uh, you know, transition essentially from uh, Kickstarter to uh, an online e commerce platform. And you, you can think of it as anyone who's on Kickstarter, like this in body band, once they've raised their, their goal money, then they have this opportunity to sell also directly 
to the public and they need a way to do it. In fact, I've used ShopLocket to help sell my book. So I signed up. It's very, very easy. And I, I loved it from a, you know, a platform standpoint. And it's, it just helps me uh, get everything done. So it's like a WYSIWYG editor. So you can imagine that if you just started a hardware startup, this is a great way to start selling your product really fast. And what they used to do um, at ShopLocket was cold call all these people that you they found on Kickstarter. And what they realized was this was really inefficient. So they started creating content called the Blueprint Weekly, okay? And this is the email that you get every Wednesday afternoon and it links to their online magazine called The Blueprint. So Wednesdays is their appointment and The Blueprint is the content brand designed specifically for this audience. And if you look at the content, first of all, it's beautifully displayed and created. And the guy that created this is Dan Claymore. He's a genius marketer and the content is unbelievably nicely laid out they, they have a magazine format to it it really even feels like a magazine uh, you can read about the issues you can see the different features it's really beautifully executed it's got a real attitude but it's only for these hardware makers that they're trying to attract and when I asked Dan what's this magazine like you know describe it to me he said that the blueprint is a mashup and let me show you what he means he said it's fast company so it's just like fast company magazine Plus Vice Magazine, if you don't know Vice, go check it out. It's got a real attitude and uh, it's a little edgy, uh, you know, for, for some it certainly maybe is over the edge. But it's Fast Company plus Vice Magazine plus Bravo's Inside the Actors Studio, which is like these in-depth interviews that are a little off-center and a little different than most interviews, but they're really long and kind of in-depth um, on a Bravo television network. So that it's, it's Fast Company plus Vice plus Bravo's Inside the Actors Studio plus Hardware Designers is the blueprint. That's the mashup he created. He took three things the audience already loved, Fast Company, Vice, and Inside the Actors Studio, and made it just for hardware designers. And all of a sudden, hardware designers around the country were signing up to read interviews of successful people who had done this already. And next thing you know, they're asking who creates this. Oh, it's ShopLocket, and they're signing up for ShopLocket. So what if we took three things our audience loves and just made them our own? What can you do? What can we do to understand what our audience already consumes? If we know what else they consume, can we mash those things up and create something new? Remember, a hook is a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to entrap or ensnare our audience. The familiar theme is the content they already know and like. And if you can kind of mirror that by mashing up a few other pieces of content they love, you can be really successful in creating a great hook. All right, I hope you're doing okay. I need another sip of water here. Ah, okay, good. Now, if you have questions, get your questions ready. We're going to do those soon. Uh, we're halfway through this, this, the secrets here, um, and the mashup is the middle of the road. We're going to get even harder, okay? Number four. This is the visual hook, okay? The visual hook is a really smart hook. It's a way of seeing that your content is different instead of just telling me your content is different. It's an easy way, an easy marker for me to immediately know that this is very unique content. And this is why it's a little harder. You've really got to think about a visual hook in kind of a new way. But it's a very, very powerful kind of concept. So I want you to start thinking about the visuals you use, even in the content you create, that could actually di you know, direct the content itself. This is actually from a brand called Say Media. Now, Say Media is a company that owns a bunch of magazines and online properties. You might know some of these. Maybe you know Exo Jane or Exo Vane or Fashionista or Gear Patrol. You know, these are these are for a very very specific type of audience. They're very good at, at honing in on an audience and owning them. But it's also an audience that traditional CMOs weren't aware of. They they didn't know these brands and they were weren't uh, you know actively pursuing them. So Say Media wanted to create some content that would get these big consumer brands to consume this content uh, so they could build a relationship with them. So I got an email actually one day from a, a CMO who said, have you checked out Say Media's Ben Friday? And I'm like, I don't know what that is. But I click the link and I get to Say Daily. Say Daily is their blog. It's their, it's their content platform that's all about marketing. It's a B2B platform for marketers from the Say Media team. And I see right on the front homepage of the ideas section, it says Madison Avenue in Silicon Valley. It's got a Venn diagram. And I click on this and you see the kind of content they create. They, there's always an image with a weird Venn diagram in it 
and a, a, a headline like if content is king who is their heir and there's a great article and some insight below it and every week as I go back in the content and look at it they have another one of these great visual hooks you can see this one's great story distribution and the magic is in the middle and you can see it's, it's even branded very well saymedia.com slash then okay so then I look at a, another one this is a great one voters go off the grid will the campaign ads follow this is hilarious. I don't know, even know what it's all about. It inspires me to read the rest of the content, but it's not a normal type of Venn diagram. Here's one about story making, story creation. This is a new take, obviously, on people creating their own, I don't know, Godzilla movies, okay? And there's great insight here for the, a new kind of audience. Here's what makes mobile ad campaigns work, and they're using Iron Man. They'll take stuff out of popular culture, add a Venn diagram, and give it something, a new meaning. So this is what This Week in Venn is. And I sign up. I go to their page, and I say, these look so good. I can't wait to read more of these. When am I going to get the next one? And on their home page, it says, Friday is Venn Day. Get it every week. That is a great micro day part, by the way. I saw, it's a great call to action, too. I, I didn't know there was a Friday Venn Day. Did you guys know? Okay, well, I'll sign up. I put in my email address, and I subscribe. And every single Friday at about 7.58 a.m., I get my This Week in Venn email. And I love it. The visual hook is immediately arresting, and it makes me wonder what the rest of the article is about, and it engages me in a new way. But this, this uh, you know, hook is what sets the stage for the rest of the content they create. So what if we created a visual hook that differentiated our content? How can we show people our content is different instead of telling me? Stop telling me your content is different. Start showing me your content is different. That is what a visual hook can help do. Okay, secret number five is the challenge. Now, this one's very, very hard, okay? This is my warning. There's one more that's even harder, but I want you to consider even trying these. The challenge is a great way to challenge yourself or uh, some experts in the industry or your team to come up with a unique brand of content, something that stands out in the marketplace. And a great example of this was created by a guy named Miles Bristow, who was the CMO at a company called Com Creative. Okay, it's a marketing agency that's based in Boston. And Miles was the CMO there and very early on was trying to come up with a new blog and content strategy with his team and they were going late into the night and they ordered some Chinese food okay and and uh, Miles Bristow um, and his team were eating the Chinese food chatting about their future of content and and one of the interns opened a, a fortune cookie and read the fortune cookie out loud and it said something like this it's a great piece of skill to know how to guide your luck even while you're waiting for it and the intern said Miles wouldn't it be funny if every day you just opened another fortune cookie and you created a, a piece of marketing advice out of this because if you added you know in marketing to the end of this it would all of a sudden be a new kind of, uh, of, of fortune it would be a marketing cookie and that's what Miles was like wow this is genius yes let's do that so every single day Every single day, by the way, he took on the, the marketing cookie challenge. That's what that Miles uh, called it. And, and uh, this is the, the fortune that I actually sent in. It got so popular that people started creating their own fortune cookie pictures and challenging Miles to create a, 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 their own, you know, his own marketing advice from their own fortune cookie. And look at this subscription invitation. Subscribe to today's marketing cookie challenge. Every day, Miles Bristow, the CMO of Com Creative, writes a post that connects a fortune cookie with marketing no matter what it says. Most of the fortunes come from cookie fans from around the world. The next time you have Chinese food, snap a photo of your fortune and send it to Miles to have a blog post dedicated to you. Interested in getting a weekly recap of today's market? Yes, I'm subscribed to the weekly recap. That is a beautiful call to action using a daily challenge to create a, a, a hook of, for the content that he's creating. I know exactly what I'm going to get. He's going to open a fortune cookie and spin that into great marketing advice. And people started doing this. In fact, George Takei was one of the people that submitted a cookie. But you can see every week he was getting these fortune cookie photos from people around the world. And it even turned into a bigger and bigger strategy that built Miles Bristow's brand as not just a CMO, but the guy behind today's marketing cookie. It even had a Pinterest strategy behind it because every time somebody sent him a picture uh, of a fortune cookie, he'd put it up on his Pinterest board and people would pin it and repin it and see these and then lead back to the content he was creating and then they'd subscribe. That's how genius this simple hook like a challenge like that for the cookie was uh, you know, delivered for him. 
The next one is called the Expert Challenge, and this is really well done by Rooster. Now, Rooster is a software as a service provider that helps you convert your abandoning visitors. You know, so if you have a shopping cart that people keep leaving uh, from, they can actually try to understand the X and intent and figure out how to get those people to sign up for your software or buy your stuff. That's the key to their success. And what they did was they actually did a great idea. They created something called the Four Hour Website Challenge, Website Optimization Challenge, and they asked a bunch of experts in the industry, if you had four hours, how would you optimize your site? What would you do? One of those guys is a friend of mine named Brian Massey. So he says, try a headline test. But this is a challenge to people, experts in the industry, that they delivered and then gave to their audience as really great content. The Rooster's Expert Challenge is a really good model for a smart hook for you to help create some new and interesting content. Now this is the hardest one. This is a great concept that um, uh, that, that I've, I've shared with my friend Michael Smart, but this is challenge yourself with complementary coverage, okay? Now complementary coverage is a very difficult concept maybe, but think about a color wheel and all the beats of a news reporter. So if you maybe if you're a science news reporter, you fit into that green, or you're a sports news reporter, or health or crime and justice. Think about the sections in your newspaper being the different colors, okay? Now think about the content we create. All of us are, are very good at creating monochromatic content. That means if we have software, we want our content to be in the technology section of the paper. Okay? Hopefully you've got that. This is very simple. The most basic kind of content we create is monochromatic. It's in the same color, business finance or energy. If you've got some solar product, you'd want to be in that section of the paper. Well, it's hard to get people to subscribe to commodity content. Remember? You want to challenge yourself. So think about even this kind of coverage. This would be a complementary color. What's opposite the wheel? Okay? So if you were in finance, uh, and you were in sports and you were going to create content that got both of those audiences excited, what would it look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. It's called Moneyball <laughs> by a best-selling book by Michael Lewis. And if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, it's a great movie. But it's all about finance meeting sports content. Okay, It's challenging you to do that. It's kind of a really smart take on it. So imagine doing complementary coverage. If you're in energy, what would the travel version of your energy content look like? Here's another good example. This would be what's called analogous Con, uh, color content. This is three content pieces that are next to each other. So it might be food and technology. Okay, the, the, IBM's Watson, which we're also going to talk about in a minute, is a great example of this. IBM can all of a sudden insert itself into the talk of the food world by creating a food truck where the the computer Watson from IBM creates its own recipes and the food truck creates them. That's how smart this content is. It's really not easy to do, but it's it's next to each other on the uh, on the complimentary coverage. Now here's the hardest one. This is called warm content. Okay, uh, this is the this is where you actually try to take split complementary coverage. This is three very different pieces of coverage like biz and finance and food and health and put them all together into one piece of content. And I got to be honest, I can't even find a good example of that. So that's the most challenging kind of content to create. But the key here is to force yourself to get creative, and that's what the complementary coverage um, you know chart does. If you started creating content on the opposite side of the wheel, what would it look like? So use this as a brainstorming mechanism to come up with a challenging type of hook. What if I created content on the opposite side of the wheel? What if we force ourselves to get creative? All right, so number five is the challenge. And the final one is number six. Number six is a really ambitious goal. It's all about the quest. I want you to go on an ambitious journey. I want you to, to challenge yourself to go after something really big. And I want you to share that journey, that quest, with your audience in an organized way. Let me show you two great examples of this. Now, I just talked about IBM Watson, but this is one of the best examples. In 2011, you know, IBM was trying to transition from a manufacturer of laptop and desktop and server computers to a service provider, to a consulting firm. And they needed a, a big way to do this because if you go back to 2011, who had all the headlines? Who was everyone talking about? What well, was Google and Apple and you know the, the, the cool companies? No one was excited about what IBM was doing. 
So one guy, Dave Ferrucci, came up with this genius idea that over the course of a year they would challenge themselves to create a computer that could play uh, Jeopardy. And they named the computer Watson. Now if you haven't seen this, I know for a lot of our international friends and family, you should go and watch the Jeopardy challenge on YouTube. Jeopardy is a game show here in the US where you have to understand the language implicitly to be able to actually answer the questions. In fact, the show is structured around an answer that you have to create the question for as the contestant. So it's very hard and it takes very smart natural language processing. So let me show you what the show looked like. I'll just show a brief clip for, the, for our international fans. From the T.J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York, this is Jeopardy! So you can, you can actually see here, I'll turn this down, you can see the, the, these two people that the computer in the middle Watson is playing against are the most successful Jeopardy contestants ever in the history of the show. And Watson went up against them and actually beat them on this audacious quest. And it launched for IBM not just you know a big PR story, but the, the, ne the last six years of, of IBM's marketing have focused explicitly on helping leverage Watson to make an impact in the marketplace. And has it worked? Yes. Mark Lowridge, their CEO, CFO, that year when they actually played Jeopardy, uh, said, we didn't invest just to play Jeopardy, we invested to prove leadership applications for our clients. And it grew their analytics business 20% that quarter, okay? That's amazing. That When your CFO loves your marketing, you have hit a home run. And that transformation and the journey that they went on to get that transformation to work and the content that's resulted from it has been unbelievably successful. You have to challenge yourself to transform your organization and share that that journey in an ex ex you know exciting way. Now, not everybody is IBM, and I understand that. Let me show you uh, a smaller version of the journey. This is a company called F Secure, and they're actually based in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, and they, they, they provide consumers with a consumer version of uh, virus protection software, but they also have a B2B version of their software. So let me show you what they've done to help embrace the CIO of medium-sized uh, you know, firms and get their attention and get them to trust F Secure as a B2B virus protection provider. Now they create lots of content on their blog and their content is pretty good, but that's not the journey I want to share with you. What they did in 2011 was actually create a 10 minute documentary called Searching for the First PC Virus in Pakistan and the virus was called Brain. Let me just play a little bit of this, this journey, this quest for you so you can get a flavor for it and then we'll talk about it briefly. Here we go. Sorry, it's slow to start. Here, here we go. Now. My name is Mikko Hyppanen, and I work here at F-Secure in Finland. And this here is Brain. Brain, the first PC virus in history. Written in January 1986, it's now 25 years old. And this here is a picture of me, almost 25 years ago, analyzing Brain. And I remember being fascinated about the virus and about how it worked, and about where it came from. And we actually know where brain comes from. Because inside the code of the brain virus, there's an address. So we know it's coming from Pakistan. And we know it's written by two brothers, Basit and Amjad. Now we're going to go and find them. You've got a long way. We're taking you back home. So I won't play the rest, but Miko is obviously a smart guy. He's the chief research officer for F-Secure, and there's not a better way to impart the trust of an organization than to see, even just see that picture of Miko, you know, when he was 20, uh, researching <laughs> PC viruses. So this is unbelievably good content. It's a really great journey. It's a quest that you could share with your audience. I want you to embark on an audacious quest. I just want you to ask yourself, what if? What if we went on this journey? What if we challenged ourselves to do X, Y, and Z? And what if we created content around that and shared it with our audience? Okay, we have, we have created 
hooks today. I, I, I've tried to help you embrace the idea of a hook. I want you to go on big quests. Think about challenging yourself or even some experts in the marketplace to come up with a, a consistent you know, type of content that's all about a challenge. Even challenge your team to get creative with the complimentary coverage. I want you to think about visual hooks. Can you come up with a visual element that's consistently delivered that makes your content look unique? Stop telling me your content is different and start showing me it's different. What if you what if you ex implement the mashup? What if you take a few things your audience already likes to consume, mash them up and make them for your audience? That's a great way of coming up with a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare and trap your audience. What if you micro day part? Own a very specific time in your audience's life and format the content around that, like whiteboard Fridays or even executive elevation. Think about a gimmick. If you just want to take it very simply, come up with a, an imp, you know, a, a, a thing, a, a hook that you do consistently from every piece of content you create. The, even if it's very simple, it helps build that relationship with your audience and make your content just a little bit different, just like Fold Factory did, or just like Wistia did with Pass the Hat. Look, a hook is a television concept, and Rachel Ray embodies what that concept looks like very simply. 30-Minute Meals is a genius example of a very simple hook, but no one's done it better maybe than Gary Vaynerchuk's simple twist on a wine show. What if ESPN Sports Center met wine tasting is a great and simple hook? In fact, it's a mashup. So I want you to create a hook. Think about your email content today and create a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare or entrap your audience. Because if you do this, you will combat commodity content. You will create less content and see bigger results. You will cut through information overload and be part of the information your audience wants to consume. And most importantly, your audience will get addicted to your content. You, my friends, have been drewed. I want you to ask yourself, what if we create a hook?